Hey guys, this is Mitch with Fine Point CGI, and today we're going to talk about materials. And we're going to talk about the importance of materials. We're going to talk about the different types of materials and things like that. And we're going to talk about painting and texture painting. And we're going to take our asset from something that's pretty okay to something that actually looks reasonably well for a game. So that's what I have in store for you guys today. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the first thing we have to talk about is materials. And this is a whole world in itself. Materials are crazy and there is so much to talk about. So first, if you remember in our previous tutorial, we went through and built this lantern here and we unwrapped it. So if I come into like this guy here and I hit tab to go into edit mode, you can see that we have this guy unwrapped. He's laid it down. So if I hit a on everything and tab, you can see everything's laid out nice and flat and straight. And that's one of the big things that we really wanted to get was to make sure that everything was laid out perfectly flat and, and perfectly packed together so that it could produce a really nice result. Now, with this being said, once you get to this point, you need to add textures to your object to make it look like some kind of materials. But before we get into all of that, let's take a step back and talk about what a material is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit shift a, and I'm going to add in a cube and I'm just going to move this guy over here. And we'll talk for a second about what a material is. So if I hit new inside of Blender here, you can see we have this beautiful cube here. And it just looks like it's almost like a matte look to it. And this is always how I like to explain materials to people. So when you look over here, you have what's called your base color. You will hear this as albedo or base color or potentially diffuse. It just depends on who you're talking to, where they're from, what kind of art they've made in the past. And the base color describes the color of an object. Now, if you add in a texture to this, which we'll go through in a second, when you add a texture to this, it allows you to make an object look like something. Okay. And you can come in here and you can change the color. So we have like a blue cube or a... I think that's green. I'm pretty colorblind, but I'm pretty sure that's green, red, and like maybe like a purple color or pink. I think that's pink or maybe a white or a black cube, right? So you can really mess around with the color and make it look like whatever color you would like. Now, the other thing that's super important about materials is subsurface and subsurface allows you to have a subsurface feel to it. So you can see how when you look, if you look at it right here, there's light penetrating the object. And this is a, this is true of any rendering engine ever. Subsurface is all about showing light penetrating something. So if I set this to nothing and I set this guy to white, you'll see there's no shine through on this object. If I pull it all the way up, you'll see how there's light penetrating the object. And that's what subsurface is all about. Then of course you have the subsurface radius and subsurface color, which can define how much light penetrates the object. Okay. And then you have subsurface IOR, which of course is the index of refraction. So how the light goes through the object and bends inside of the object which is really important for things like skin or irises or any meaty pieces. Subsurface is really important. Next is metallic and metallic defines the object as something that's made of metal. So if you drag this up, you'll notice that it suddenly looks like it's now made out of steel or some kind of, you know, metal based surface. And it's really useful when you want to create something that looks like metal. And you'll definitely use a texture map for this all the time. I cannot tell you how often it's used because it's used pretty much every time. I very rarely do not have a metallic map that goes with my textures. 
specular here is all about how much shine an object has. So what I mean by that is when light hits an object, how much of light bounces off of that object. And that's what specular is used for. Specular tint allows you to tint the specular. So for instance, if you wanted some kind of light change a little bit, when you hit an object and it kind of uh, shines off of it, how that shines color is going to be different, if that makes sense. Next up is roughness, and it's easiest to show that when you are a high metallic object, so that's why I left metallic on. But if we take a look at it, I can drag this guy up, and you'll see suddenly it becomes a very matte object, and matte means that it's not very shiny. If I drag my roughness down, you'll see that it becomes very mirror-like, like that. And this is one of the biggest sliders that I use inside of Blender or in any game engine or any rendering engine I've ever used. Roughness, metallic, and base color are some of the most important things that you will ever use. Anisotropic allows you to adjust the what's called anisotropy of an object. And it's really hard to show it without going into really, really far detail. But anisotropy is how the light bends when it hits an object. Think of it kind of like if you've ever seen a stainless steel appliance, anisotropy is gigantic in that material. Unfortunately, when it's a cube like this, you really don't get to see the anisotropy. You can see how it doesn't really affect it that much. You know, if I were to drag this down, it doesn't really do all that much. But that's mainly just because I don't have any texture maps to throw in here, so it's not really gonna show much. Now you also have sheen and sheen is something that I never use, but it's very useful to add sheen to an object. So to add a little bit of extra shininess to it. Clear coat allows you to add a clear coat. And what I mean by that is if I hit shift A and I add in a UV sphere like so, and I select this guy and I make it a smooth shaded object, and I come in here and I add in a material, I'll show you what sheen does. So if I bring my roughness down on this object, you can see how it's kind of shiny, right? Which makes sense. But if I wanna make a porcelain-like material, porcelain itself is not shiny, but the clear coat that is on porcelain is extremely shiny. So if you up your roughness like so, so it's more like a porcelain-y feel, and then you add a clear coat to it, you'll see that you get that shininess that porcelain has, but you also have that matte feel to it as well. And it's really easy to tell when you kind of do one of these numbers and you look over here, you can see how it's shiny, really, really shiny right here and almost like a mirror effect but it's not because of the actual roughness value. I can set that to fully rough and you can see how there's just a slight amount of shine to this object because it has a clear coat. If I get rid of my clear coat, it goes away. If I add it, it's there. Now in game design, clear coat is not really used. That's just mixed into the texture itself. You would have something kind of like this to make it you know, seem like more like a porcelain-y texture. But that's just the limitation of game engines. But that being said, there are, you know, shaders and things like that that of course allow for that. Next one is IOR and that's the index of refraction. And a lot of times this will be used for something like glass or something like that. 1.45 is the IOR of glass. So if you ever want to see something cool, you can come into here and there is a website called Pixel and Poly, and they have the IOR of a bunch of things. You can see right here. So what they did was they took and measured the index of refraction of all of these different objects. So if you want to have a very accurate looking object, you can come in here and just throw the IOR value into here and you will get a more accurate object on how it refracts the light. Now, again, this is stuff that we're not really going to use for game design inside of Blender, but it is something that we can use in our own game engine of choice. Transmission is how we handle glass. Now, generally speaking, this doesn't really work 
too well inside of Eevee, so I don't really use it, but you definitely can use it if you want to. And transmission roughness allows you to kind of create that frosted glass effect, if that makes sense. If we get rid of both of those guys, emission is how much light this object will emit. So you can see when I pull this guy out, he'll start emitting light. And of course, if we up our emission strength, it will emit more light. Now, this doesn't really work inside of Eevee. However, it can be useful for if you're creating characters or something like that, or if you were baking down your material down to an actual um, texture set, emission can be really, really useful for that. Alpha allows you to see right straight through an object, which can be very useful for objects that you may want to cast a shadow or something like that, but you don't want it to render in the actual scene. And then, of course, you have normal, clear court, normal, and tangent, which is very useful. You have your normal map, your clear court, coat, normal map, and your tangent map. Uh, generally speaking, I mostly use normal map, but, you know, your mileage may vary. Volume is if you're doing any volumetric rendering. Settings is for all of your settings. So blend maps, opaque, hashed, alpha clipping, alpha hashed, and alpha blend. Now they all have different uses. So for instance, like alpha blend is really useful if you wanna add some transmission to an object. I believe it's alpha blend that allows you to do that or else it's alpha hashed. But one of these guys allows you to do that, which is very, very useful. Opaque is if you don't want to take in any transmission or alpha stuff at all, which can be very useful. Line art is if you want line art and viewport display is so you can see it in your viewport. So if you come into like regular viewport view here, you can adjust how it looks. So that way you can actually, you know, just have a different look when you're messing around your scene, which can be very useful. And that's pretty much all of the options inside of this little panel here. Now, if you remember, when we wanted to add, for instance, a diffuse map to this object here, what we did was we came into, we selected out on base color and we went to image texture and we chose an image texture. If I go to my downloads and I go to metal and I select this guy, we chose a metal something like this and that allowed us to have a nice metal object, right? That's really cool and all, but there is an easier way. If we come up to the top and we go to shading, we can use Blender's node editor to actually build our textures. So this is really cool because it allows us to actually build a material using nodes and using some stuff we're gonna talk about later, you can actually take all of that work and bake it down into a texture that your game engine can use, which can be really, really cool and can save you a lot of trouble. So this is cool, but how do we use it? Well, first, if you click, you'll unselect everything. Second, if you hit middle mouse button and you drag, you will pan around the room. You will pan around that area. And if you click a node and you have it selected, you can drag and you can move it around, which can be really useful. You can also hit the delete key to delete a node if you need to. And you can hit shift A to add in a node. You're gonna be using those key combinations the most. Middle mouse button, shift A, clicking and dragging, and deleting your stuff. So that's cool, but how do we use it to build a material like we did here? Well, that's really simple. If we zoom in on our cube here, and we wanna add in a image texture, we can just hit Shift A and come to Texture, Image Texture, and there's our image texture. Then we can click open and we can choose our downloads, metal, and then our metal. That's really cool, but how do we connect it to this guy? That's where these little tiny handles come in. So these handles are really useful because they allow us to just click and drag and we can drag this handle into another 
handle that is the same color. So if we let go, you'll see that it took effect. It actually grabbed that texture and applied it to the object. So that's cool. So now we can basically just hit shift a texture image texture, and then we can hit open and go to wherever it is that we need to go to, to get our texture. And we could drag it in a metalness texture. We can do the same thing, but you'll notice that metallic is gray and this is yellow. So what does that mean? Well, yellow means we have three channels to it. It's a vector three. It's three separate channels. It has the R, the G, and the B channel. So it has red, green, and blue. So I know your question might be, can you drag this into this? And yes, you can. And you'll see that now it has that metallic-y look to it. Now, what this does is it says, hey, I'm going to take this. I'm going to clamp all of my values and get an average, and I'm going to put it into my metallic. And this is extremely useful because it allows you to basically say, hey, I'm going to take this. I don't care if it doesn't keep all the information as long as it keeps the grayscale information, and I'm just going to put it in here. Now, this hitting shift A texture, image texture is really, really slow. And I'm not sure about you, but, you know, a lot of times I like to try to get things done really fast. So is there a faster way to import stuff into our graph editor here. And yes, there is. If we go out to our downloads and we go into our metal, which that's not the correct metal. If we go into our metal and then we come up to our roughness map and we just drag it in to blender, it will automatically drop it in, which is really cool. So we can do the same thing with our normal map as well. We can drag our roughness map down and we can just drag it into our roughness channel. And you'll notice that suddenly it's starting to look like metal. Now it's not quite perfect because that is really shiny. And if we look at our reference photo, this is what it should look like, but it doesn't, it looks extremely shiny. So let's see if our normal map will solve that. So if we drag in our normal map here and we drag it into our normal, you'll notice that it looks terrible. Now, why is that? Well, if you notice that this is a blue color, not a gray color or a yellow color, and blue means it has to have a special input, and that is a normal input. So we have to take this and we have to convert it into normal information. So that's cool, but how do we do that? Well, if you hit Shift A and you come down into Vector and you say Normal Map because this is a normal map, and we drag this guy on top of this guy and we click, you'll see it's going to automatically apply this normal map operation. But you'll notice that it still doesn't look quite right. Well, here's the thing about normal maps. So if you look at this normal map, it looks pretty awful, not going to lie. So why does it look terrible? Well, the reason why it looks terrible is because you have to tell Blender that this normal map should not be used in sRGB color space. It needs to be used in the non-color data color space. And if you do that, you'll notice that your normal map completely changed. If we take off our roughness map, because we're going to have to come back to that in a second, you'll notice that if I come in here and I really crank my normal map strength up like that, and I change this to srgp you'll see you have this weird shininess about it right but if we go from srgb to non-color data you'll notice that that shininess goes away and everything looks just a little bit better the reason why we want to use non-color data is because when you bring something in with color data with srgb blender tries its best to gamma correct it and that's useful for some textures, but not for all textures. And you want to be careful when you bring them in because it can make your stuff look terrible if you don't switch them to non-colored data. Because Blender is going to gamma correct it, it's going to make it not be exactly the way that the original person intended for that normal map to work. So it makes everything look kind of funky. And that's just something to keep in mind. 
And the same goes, technically speaking, for roughness and metallic. If we drag our roughness back in, you'll see that it is super duper duper shiny. But if we come in here and we change this to non-color data, you'll see it still looks pretty shiny, but it looks more like how it should. And we should probably back this normal map down to something like one, so that way you guys can kind of see what it looks like. You see with sRGB, it looks like that. And with non-colored data, it looks like that. And the reason why is because Blender is trying to gamma correct this image and it's trying to make it look more accurate based off of the rendering engine itself. So if you were to take this image and bring it into the rendering engine and like light it and make it look cool, like a picture on a wall, sRGB would make sense, especially if you're using sRGB as your gamma correction system. But it doesn't work really well when you're defining a texture's values. Now you do want sRGB for your color value because it needs that gamma correction. If you do it as non-color data, it'll look like this, like a nasty gray color. And we don't want that, right? We want it to look true to life. So we'll use sRGB to help gamma correct it so that way it's lit properly. But you'll see if we do the same thing with metalness and we go to non-color, you'll see now it looks like it's made of metal. And now it looks like a metal cube. Now, I know what one of your questions might be, and that is, well, what is a roughness map? Well, a roughness map is a gray map that defines how shiny something is. It's from a zero being super smooth to white, which means super rough, very rough and not shiny at all. And that's how we can tell our materials to look like something like metal or wood or something like that is by using different patterns of gray, we can say this part of this material is this much roughness. And that translates directly to, if you look at this object, where there are dark spots, there are little patterns of roughness. And you can see where this is. All throughout this section here, you can see there's little lines throughout this. And if you look at this, you can see, if you look at it at an angle, right here is just a little bit rougher than right here. And that's how we can determine that this is the material that it is. And same thing goes with metallic. You can see how we have little speckles of not metallicness. And they, you can tell in here, there's little tiny speckles of things that are not metallic in here to make it look more realistic and to make it not look so uniform. If we were to get rid of our metallic and our roughness material pieces, you can see how that looks. So if I bring roughness down, that's how it would look. If I drag my roughness in like so, you can see how it adds just a bunch more depth to the tech material. And if I drag metallic in, you can see it adds even more depth to that material. So that's really cool. But why do we have this graph editor? What's the point of it? Is it actually useful to us? Does it give us any benefit over top of using this sec this little panel here? And the quick answer is yes. And I'll explain how. So if we come over to our lantern here and I hit the tilde key and I go to view selected to kind of center my viewport. If we come in here and we select everything by clicking and dragging like so, and then we hit shift and click and then delete these guys. And we come in here and we add in these textures once again. So color, metalness, normal and roughness. And then we come in here and we drag in our color. We drag in our roughness. We drag in our normal map into our normal map. And then we drag in our metallic like so. Now we have ourselves a metal looking lantern, right? And it looks pretty okay. There are some spots in here that I don't necessarily like, but it doesn't look too shabby. Now. This is really cool, but 
one of our big things about our game is that our lantern is not perfect. It has rust, right? It has things that makes it not perfect and not out of cast iron like this. So how can we make this look like it has some rust on it? Well, that's where a rust texture set comes in. You can see right here, I have a rust texture set. Now, if we just come up here and we drag in this color, we drag in this metalness, we drag in the normal map and the roughness map like this, and we come in and we just say, okay, this is non-color data, this is non-color data, and the metalness is non-color data. If we just drag in our color and bring it into our base color, you'll see that now it looks like it's made out of copper or out of some kind of brass or something, right? But that's not what rust looks like. And we can't just take this guy and drop it in, right? We can't just pass in our normal map like this because it doesn't really do anything for us. So how can we make this work for us? Well, that's where mixing materials comes in. So what does mixing a material mean? Well, what you can do inside of Blender is you can mix different maps with other maps. And what that means is you can hit Shift A and you can come in here and go into Color Mix RGB and you can put this guy in like this. What this is going to do is it's going to mix color one and color two by whatever this factor is. So if we come in here and I drag this factor down, you'll see that it looks like it's made out of the cast iron material. But if I drag this all the way up, you can see that it looks like that cast iron material just turned white. And that's because it did. If I change this to green, you'll see it's now green. It's now blue. It's now red. And that's what this mix is for. So if I come in here and I drag in my color map like so, and I drop it in like that, and I come in and I mix it by 0.5, you'll see that we now have a slight reddish black hue. And that's not super useful to us because that's not really solving the problem. Like, yeah, we can kind of mess around with it and we could come in and and do different blending modes. We could like screen it on top of the other one or darken it or multiply it or something like that, but that's not helpful to us. But that's where the factor comes in. You can see that it has this really fancy little gray pullout here, right? Well, if you just grab this guy and let go and type noise and hit enter, now we're cooking with some gas. And I know you can't quite tell just yet, but this is where things get cool. If you take a look at it and you down your scale, something like this, and then you start messing around with this texture here. And you can see that it's, it's not quite doing what we want, right? So what if we hit shift A and add in a converter and we put in a color ramp node? Color ramp allows you to crush values. So watch this. This is where things get really cool. If we drag this up like so, and we drag this down like that, now you can see we have sections of our object with rust on it. And we can mess with this and make it look completely crazy. You can come in and add detail like that. You can add some roughness to help make it look like it has had some rust on it. And we can come in and we can add more rust like so. So we could come in and say, this thing has been rusting for a while. So there we go. And there you go. Isn't that cool? And the crazy part is this works for all of these guys. So if we hit shift duplicate to duplicate this, so shift D and put this guy in, and then we come in and we go, okay, where's my roughness right here. So we'll drag this guy down here and plug it in right here. And then we grab 
up here, the factor value of this color ramp and drag it into here, you'll see how some parts of it are shiny and some parts of it aren't. And then we could do the same thing. So if we shift duplicate our mix, drop it into our metalness, and then we come in here, grab our metalness and drag it in like that. And then we come in here and we grab our factor value like so, come down, drop it in. And then we do the last one, which is our normal map. So we shift duplicate this. And then we come up here, we drag in our factor value just like this. And then we drag in our normal map, which I don't know what I did with it. I put it down here. We drag this guy into this guy like that. There we go. Now we have two materials being mixed together by this noise texture. And this is the power of Blender. This is one of the coolest things about Blender. So I can come in and I could pull my distortion away like that to make it more like actual rust, how rust would be on an object. And then I can come in here and I can crush these guys like so. And there we go. Now I have rust spattered all throughout my object. And it's really that simple. And there we go. Now, the other cool thing is if I wanted to, I could come in and I could pull this back to help give this thing a rusted fade look like this. And there you go. Now, this might be too much. This might be too little. But here's the cool part about this. If we pull this back like this, there you go. Now we have ourselves a rustic looking lantern that has rust on it. Some parts of it are, are perfectly rusted. Some parts of it are not. Now, one of the big problems that I have with this is the scale of this rust is huge. This, this rust is gigantic. If you actually look at it by itself, so if we come in and just pull this up, you'll notice that the rust is giant. They're, it's very large. You can see this gigantic rust spot right here. And that's a problem. So how can we make the tiling of this texture better? That's where vector coordinates come in. So what are those? Well, if we drag back on this vector, you'll see we have all sorts of stuff in here. And we could just type mapping like that. And we could drop in a mapping coordinate node here. And we can connect this to our roughness we can connect this to our metalness and we can connect this to our color. And then we can also drag down and connect it to our normal map as well, like that. Now you'll notice that everything's broken. Why is that? And that's because the mapping node needs to go off of something. We can't just go off of the mapping node itself. We need to go off of some kind of vector. And that's where your UVs come in. So if we hit Shift A, we hit search, we type coordinates, and we bring in a texture coordinates, and we just drop in our UVs into our vector like that. And there we go. Now everything's back to where it was, right? So what did this do for us? So what it gave us was the ability to use this scale here to adjust this map. So what we can do is we can drag these guys up, and you can see just what it does. So if we drag this up to something like 10 and we drag this something up to about 10, like so, that's a lot more like what we were expecting it to be, right? That's about right for rust size. Especially if we come in here, we go into our texture, we pull this guy up like this to give ourselves a little bit more of that metallic shine through like that. And now we got ourselves a nice decrepit looking lantern. And it's really that simple. And the craziest part is it's not just one material we can do this to. We could technically add in as many textures as we want and make it look however we want. We can just drag stuff in and it'll just work for us, which is awesome. And it can save us a bunch of work when we're doing our texturing.
we can come in and just generate out how our texture is going to lay in and then come in and clean it up and make it look better. Now I'll show you guys how to do that in a moment, but just know that this is super powerful. You can do so much to, with it. If you come in here, you can actually come in here and let's grab a metal and grab in this displacement texture, right? We could drag this guy in here and drop it. And you'll see that if we change this to non-color data, now it's going off of this displacement texture. It's the coolest stuff in the world. If you start playing around with it, you'll, you'll notice just how cool it actually is. They basically, we can take this displacement texture, throw it on here, and it will have sections where it has more rust than other places. Or we can drag this in and just use our noise texture. It's up to you guys. You guys can do whatever you want. The world's kind of your oyster when it comes to this specific texturing method. I've always enjoyed this method because you can get a lot of really cool looking materials in a few seconds if you know what you're doing inside of Blender. So this is cool. And that basically describes what this is. Now there is one other way to do this that's a lot simpler than what I have here. So if you take a look at all these guys, they're mixing in by each texture to a single shader node. But shaders in Blender are malleable, much like materials are in other applications. Shaders are extremely malleable. So you can actually do operations over here on the right side of this shader and have it apply to this material output. So what does that actually mean though? Well, that means that you can duplicate this shader here, like so. You can hit Shift A and add in a mix shader node and drag the shader in and then drag this shader in like this. And then you can just connect these guys like so. And now you're mixing two shaders together based off of a factor value. So you can come in here and drag this and you can see the two shaders being mixed. So what does that mean for us? Well, if we just drag our color ramp into our factor value, you'll see that we have one half of a shader and another half of a shader connected and being mixed down into an actual material. So we can basically just come in here and say, okay, I want my rust color to be up here. I want my rust metalness to be up here as well. And I want my rust roughness up here. Like that. And finally, I want my rust normal. So I'll have to duplicate this normal map and I'll have to connect it to this like that. And then drag this guy all the way up here and throw it in like that. And then we can basically just come in here and say, okay, we know that all of our stuff's being mixed. So I'm just going to say metal like that. And I'm going to delete this. And then roughness like that. And then I can delete my mix. And then my normal map like that. And I can delete my mix. And then I have one more mix, which I'll just grab and drag it up for my metallic and then delete that. And now I have the exact same result. The difference is, is that it can be a lot cleaner. And what I mean by that is if I grab all of these guys and I drag them up. So let's just select all these guys. Let's drag them up here like that. I can put my texture and my material up like this. And I can put my little noise texture right over here. And now everything's a little bit more organized and a little bit easier to work with. And that's kind of the goal here is just to make things a bit simpler and more organized for us to use. So that's just something to keep in mind. It will help a lot with your material management if you just start mixing materials over here on the back end. 
Now, what if I want some more control? Because right now we're basically just projecting this material on it and we don't really have a lot of control. Well, that's where texture painting comes in. And one of the coolest things about Blender is it is a packaged deal. It does everything inside of this tool. So what I mean by that is we can come in and actually paint our stuff where we want it instead of just throwing it onto our material. But before we do that, let me copy and paste this real quick. Something's bothering me real quick. I'm going to grab these guys, control duplicate. And I'm going to drag these guys down and I'm just going to drag these into this vector like so. And the reason why is because the um, scale of this object metal material is not as good as I'd like it to be. So I'm going to just drag this stuff in, rescale it so that it makes more sense. So that way it's a proper metal scale. That's a lot closer to what actual metal is. Because the problem is if we have it set to one, you can see how big this is. That's not really what metal is in terms of scale, at least for this object size. So we'd want something like seven or maybe eight just to help with, you know, making it a little bit more, you know, metal feeling. Now let's talk about texture painting. Texture painting is awesome. If I head over to this cube here and I zoom into it by hitting tilde view selected and I come up here, if I want to paint on this object, all I have to do is go to texture paint mode and go over to the object and give it an image to paint on. Now, if I paint on this as it is, it will affect this object as well because I have a metal image picked specifically and we don't want that necessarily. So let's come into our shading mode and let's get rid of this guy, shift A, and let's just add in a image texture like that. And let's drag this guy in like so. And then let's hit new. And we'll just drop in a nice 1024 uh, size texture. And then if we come back to texture paint, you'll see that we have untitled one right here. And you'll see that if we just come in here, we can just click and drag and we can paint on this object. You can see it's getting reflected over here on the 2D paint mode. And also you can click and drag and it will paint over here on the 3D side. So these two work together to do all of your painting. And it's super useful, but let's talk about some of the user interface and the tools with painting. So let's first start by talking about this right pane right over here. So this pane is super useful. So first you have brushes, which is where all of your brushes are located. Now, in my case, I don't have any brushes because Blender by default just gives you one, which is this little paint brush right here. Next is the brush settings. And basically you can have different settings for each type of brush. And the nice thing about this is you can actually build out your own brush catalog with all of these settings and you can save them. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Radius sets the radius. So the size of your brush, you can see now it's much larger. If I drag it down, it's smaller. And that's basically what radius is used for. Next is the strength. That's how strong the painting is. A lot of times when I'm doing my painting, I usually just have it set to like 0.2 or 0.3 because then it requires multiple passes for me to paint that area. So for instance, if I start painting like this, you can see that I get almost like a nice hand drawn effect to it. So if you were to come in here and, and say, I'm going to paint like this to kind of add highlights to something, you can do that without having it look like it's just a flat color, if that makes sense. And you can get a really nice painted look through Blender by doing it this way. So that's something to keep in mind. I was playing a game a while back where they had a lot of their objects that had streaks like this in it. And this is kind of how you can achieve that effect is by doing that. See, now it looks like it's kind of like a painted effect or drawing effect. 
Next is the color picker. So you can actually pick colors and maybe I should drag this out a tiny bit. And if you want, you can go like blue like that. Now I'm painting with blue. If I want, I can paint with yellow. And of course, because I have this set to 0.3, it's starting to combine those colors a little bit to help give different representations of those colors. Color palette allows you to actually set up a color palette. So you can come in and click on multiple colors like so, and you can quickly switch between them. Very useful. Advanced is just advanced stuff. So if it affects your alpha or something like that, that's what this is for. Texture is super cool. So if I click on this and I click new, I can paint a texture on to this object. So if I set this to pure white, like so, and I come into my texture. So if I click on this guy and I make sure I have him selected and I go into my texture properties, and that's what this is right here. It's called texture properties, but I can come in here and I can select a texture like my color and I can come in here and I can draw with that color. And it's that simple. So now I have that metal color all over this side of the cube here. Now you'll see that it didn't project the actual material onto this. And that's where something I'm going to show you in the future will come in handy. But that's what the texture option is used for. Now the texture option has a multiple settings to it. They have a mapping thing here where you can actually set different settings. So for instance, they have view plane where it projects based off of your view plane. So you can see that it kind of smears it because it's designed for you to kind of click like so. And then it will throw that in like that. So you can just kind of come in and click, 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 click. And then there we go. It's now projected that onto the view plane. 3D allows you to map this based off of 3D. I don't ever use this mapping, but basically it uses plenty of mapping to help throw this on here from what I understand. I very, very rarely use it. Random randomly assigns the map so you can just start painting and it will randomize how it throws that color in. So you can see how it's randomizing it every time we draw it in, which can be really useful if you're doing something like dirt or some kind of rust material or something like that. And finally, there's stencil. And stencil is the one that I use the most. So you'll see that you have this guy here that's kind of floating in space. And what this does is it allows you to draw on a mesh based off of where this is placed. So if I kind of come in here and I click and I draw, and let me set this to one so I can show you guys how this works. So I'll set my radius to 32. I'll set my strength to one. I'll come over here and I'll just draw like this. If I let go, you will see that when I move, it is an exact representation of what I drew here. And that's because what it's doing is it's using this as a stencil and it's projecting that texture onto the object. So if I come up to the top and I just draw right here, like this, and then I move this, you'll see I have an exact projection of that texture. So that's really cool. So how do I move it? Well, if you right click, you can move it around. So it's kind of nice because when you want to project some texture like this, you can come in and just kind of start projecting a texture and merging this texture the way you want it to be merged. That's one of the big advantages of the stencil mode. You can also hit control and right mouse button to rotate it and shift to scale it. So that way you have the option to scale it, move it, rotate it, and then you can paint it by clicking. And that's how that works. You also have image aspect, which basically just sets, allows you to set the image aspect and reset transform, which allows you to reset the transform. You can also change the angle offset and size right here if you need to. So you can change the angle to different things and it will adjust your angle of this. Offset will offset it and size will change the size. 
Now, again, I never touch these. I just do it in here with the hotkeys because that's just what I was always taught was how to do it with the hotkeys. So that's how I do it. Now, if we take this guy off and we get bring that down, if we open up the next one, we have texture mask and texture mask allows you to mask a paint with a texture. So if I select this and I select my texture and I start painting, you'll notice that I'm getting white, but in a way that looks like that material. And the reason why is because it is using this as a great scale texture to project this color onto it. So it's really useful if you want to get a nice pattern, but in a specific color. So for instance, if I go with blue, there you go. So because this is lighter than this is, these bottom parts here get filled in more than these top parts because it's darker. So it gets filled in. And of course, all of the different mask mapping stuff works just like it does for texture. These two combined are super useful. So I'm going to get rid of that real quick. Next up is stroke and stroke is about how your stroke is set. And this is something you're going to change a lot, especially if you do a lot of painting. So if you come in here, you can see you can stroke. If you go in here and you go to dots and I draw, you'll see that it is slightly different in how it paints. If I click space, you'll see that it paints slightly different as well. If I come in here and I set this to like 137, there you go. You can see kind of how it works. Whereas if I do dots, it paints it in as like dots. And if I set the jitter to something really high, you'll see how it's kind of throwing these dots everywhere like that. So that's kind of what dots are for. Drag dots, same thing. It's only when you drag and let go, does it drop that color. So you can see when I click, I can drag it and let go. This is really nice if you want to drag stuff like rivets onto a machine or something like that. This is really useful for that. You can just drag and drop them in. It's really simple. Airbrush works like an airbrush. So you can see when I, providing that I don't have my jitter so high, if I drag that down, it works kind of like an airbrush would. Anchored anchors it. Line draws it in a straight line. So if I drag this over and I adjust my spacing down to something like 0.6 or so, and I drag, let's make this pink. I click drag. You can see it draws a line. Curve does the same thing, but for curves. So you can click, click, and click, and then draw out a curve, and it will paint it as well. Fall off is how we do our fall off. So if I come into my stroke and I change this to dots, which is basically what I usually have my thing set to because it's just a nice paint, big old splotchy paint. But if I go to fall off and I come in here, I can drag this down like this and you'll notice that it's a lot softer to work with. So this could be nice when you wanna change how your stuff feathers. So you can see if I come in here now, it put a gigantic circle instead because of how it's feathered off like that. So that's something to keep in mind. It's really nice and useful. So you can actually just come in here and really adjust your stuff. So you can see if I do something like this and I change this to blue, let's say. Now I've got perfect round wavy circles on my object. And that's kind of what this is used for, is that you can change how it falls off and how it works. Now I'm gonna reset this to here and they have a bunch of presets here that are really useful for various things. The normal one is this one, so you guys can use that. Normal fall off is how it determines if it's gonna paint something based off of the normal. Cursor talks about the cursor itself, so that's, nice. You can change it like blue and you can see it's blue. You can change it to be white, which was what it was. So it'd be white. That's pretty much how that works. Now, if we come down to masking, you also have a lot of masking and I don't really want to go too far into masking, but basically you can mask based off of cavities. You can mask based off of stencils. 
and things like that. And it's really nice and super useful. The cavity one, especially because you can come in and say, I only want to paint ridges and not valleys. So if you want to paint like redness in someone's face and you don't want it to get into the pores, then you can do that with the cavity mask. It's really nice and super useful to use. Symmetry allows you to have symmetry. So if I come over here and I give it X symmetry, you can see if I change this to white, because I don't think we have any white here, I now have symmetry. So I can draw a heart just like that. Very simple. That's kind of a bad heart, but you get what I'm trying to do. There we go. And symmetry is very useful for having symmetrical stuff. And you can do the same thing with Y axes, of course. And just kind of drag this up. And now you have that Y symmetrical thing. So you could do stuff like Taurus knots and things like that really, really easily. Options are some last minute options. You guys can check those out, but they're really cool. And workspace is all of your workspace stuff. Most of this is stuff that you're never going to use, but it's nice to have. So that's pretty much all of this stuff. Now over here, we have some other tools. So if we click on this, you can see we have a soften. And you can see we have a bunch of options here. A lot of them are pretty much the same. Mostly what you would you know, mess with are these guys right here, which is sharpen, soften, and how we're softening it. If you drag your radius up and you just start softening, you'll see that it starts blurring this stuff. It's softening it. It's blurring it together. If you were to click on this guy, this is smear. If you drag, you can see it's smearing it. Well, I guess technically I should... Go like this to make it smaller. It'll make it a little easier to see. You can see I'm smearing it as if I'm dragging my finger on it. And then the clone brush, which allows you to hit control click and then allows you to clone. Now I have symmetry on, so let's shut that off real quick. And let me just select this guy right here with control click. And then if I start drawing, you'll see that it's cloning this object. And if I come into my stroke, think that will work. So if I click and I drag, you can see it's cloning this bit here, which is nice and very useful. And then you have fill, which if you just click, it fills it with whatever color you want. And that's pretty much how that works. And then you have masking and masking allows you to mask stuff out from your stencils. And I generally don't use it, but it's nice to have. So this is all cool. But how does it relate to our lantern here? Well, let me show you. So if we come over to our lantern and I get out of texture paint mode and I go into shading mode and I come over here and I select my lantern and I come into its shader here. And instead of doing a noise texture, with a color ramp, let's drag this out. Let's hit click and drag and let's hit G to move it. And then let's hit shift a and add in an image texture. Now let's drag that into our factor value. Now let's click new and let's make it a 2048 by 2048. And let's just call it rust slash iron mix and let's make it black by default. Let's hit okay. Now you'll see that it's all rust, which is cool, but not quite what we're looking for, right? Well, here's where it gets cool. So if we go into texture paint mode, and it's going to take a minute. If we come in here, you can see we have our object. Let me view selected. That'll get us nice and close. You can see we have our object here. Now, here's where things get cool. If we go to material mode, we have our material. If we come over to our fill, and let's fill this with white. So if we head over to our tools, let's click on rust iron mix, and let's fill it with white. Now you'll see that we have our iron. Now you could probably guess where we're going with this. If I go to draw, I can come in here and paint black with a low strength value. And now watch, if I come in here and I start painting, you'll see that the 
rust starts coming through. So I know that rust tends to accumulate up here in kind of corners, things like that. So we can kind of just paint our material in. And I know a lot of people ask me, well, you know, Mitch, do you use substance painter? Do you use, you know, other painting tools that are out there like Marmoset or Quixel Mix or anything like that? And I would be lying if I said I didn't use them, but I can tell you that generally speaking, I can use Blender for everything in my workflow if I want to. Now you can see we're getting a little bit overzealous here. You can see how it's becoming really, really white. So what we can do is we can come in here and grab white and just kind of draw up our strength and kind of paint. And that'll start pulling that back a bit. So we have a little bit more leeway. Now we can come down here into our fall off and we can drag this down like this to give us more of a fall off. So it's a little bit smoother, a little bit nicer. And that's kind of the really cool part about blenders that you can come in and paint these guys and make them look the way you want them to look. And you can see that I can just come in and paint a little bit of rust at a time. Like that. Now this might be too much rust. So we'll just drag it up to white and start eliminating it. Now here comes the cool part. So if I want to paint rust and I want to paint rust quickly over my object and have it look somewhat natural, I can come down here and I can come to my texture mask and I can mask my texture if I hit new and I choose a texture here by clicking on brush mask and I choose my image texture. And then I can select something that has a really cool design. So for instance, like metalness, this guy here. If I come in here and I start painting up here, you'll notice that it doesn't do anything. So let me go up to my texture here. It might not be a strong enough color, so let me try painting with black. There we go. That's a bit stronger. So we'll paint this whole section here, providing that Blender wants to cooperate. Now, one of the things that I tell you is a lot of times things get really, really slow. So what you can do to help with that is if you come into your modifiers and just start shutting them off, that will help a lot with performance. So if we come in here and click on these little monitors, it'll shut off all of those modifiers and you'll see that suddenly we have a much simpler object and we can come in and just start painting and you can see that it that it took it but you can see that's a lot more what we're looking for it's more handmade we can pick where we want our rust to be that's probably too much so let's come into here Let's go into our rust iron mix. Let's drag this up to kind of like a medium gray, maybe a bit higher. It's probably still too much. So let's paint white to try to bring this down. But you can see how you can make your stuff look really good using just Blender. And that's something I absolutely love about this tool is that Blender can be used for just about everything. Now, the other cool part is if I want to just come in here, I can. So I can come in here and just start painting like this, which is always faster for me because I could just come in here and paint them up like this like that, and there I have rust all over my object. Now there is a segment here where we're getting this weird funky edge here. So we can come in and start deleting that edge quite a bit. You can see how easy it is to actually make our material look way better than what it did. And you know what, if we don't like it, right, we can come in here 
and just come up here like this and drag and drop it like so. And there you go. So that's kind of the beauty of this whole system is that it's non-destructive and it's easy to work with. We don't necessarily have to choose between, well, do I wanna mix it with this guy or do I wanna mix it with this guy? We can actually come in and add in a mix node like this and mix our RGBs together like so. And you'll see that now we get some of one and some of the other. We can come in and fade through them and get different looks based off of what we want. We can also mix in a factor value and actually make it, you know, a bit different. So remember how we had this noise texture? Well, we could just come in here, duplicate it like so, and drag that factor into factor and then adjust the scale and duplicate that color ramp, throw that in, and we can actually come in and mess with this to blend the two if we want to. So you're not stuck with exactly one way of doing things. You can combine and mix and match and stuff like that. To make this look really good, it would take a very long time and lots of painting to do it. So don't get discouraged if you just do it for a little bit and then it just doesn't look good or it's not coming out the way you like. Like for instance, this is not, it's not great. It's not bad, but it's not great, right? So a lot of times in my experience, I just go in and I just reset it and I just try again. And I keep trying until I get something that I like. And remember, you are not required to use one material. If we take a look at ambient CG, you can see here, if we type in metal, we have hundreds of options of different types of metal. So don't get discouraged and just pick a metal that you think is cool, mess with it. And then if it doesn't work, just throw it away and try again. So I'm going to mess around with this for a little bit, and I'm going to try to make this into an asset that's, you know, truly something special. And then in the next video, what we'll do is we'll come in and we will learn about performance. But for right now, I will be right back.
Now, something that we forgot to talk about is this little piece in here. Now, these little pieces generally are made of something like a brushed aluminum or something like that. So if we come in here and we get rid of its material and then added a new one, if we go back to our shading section in here, you'll see that I have a whole new material I can work with. So materials don't have to be specific, exact object. So you can have multiple materials per asset. You don't have to worry about just having one. Now in our case, we're gonna dump this out to an actual texture so that way it it is all going to be one, but you don't have to have it as one. Back in the day, these were basically like a brass, okay? Now, thankfully, Ambient CG probably has some kind of brass material. So we could probably pull a patina brass, something like this guy here. And we'll just pull down the JPEGs because it really doesn't matter if I lose a little bit of detail. I don't think it's that gonna be that big of a deal. So I'm gonna extract this guy like so. And I'll just drag this in like this. There we go. And then we can hook them up. So we'll just drag it in like so. So color, normal can come down here. Roughness needs to go in here and metalness needs to go in here. And then we need to change these to non-color. So that way it reacts the way we expect. And then we will add in a normal map as well. And make sure that this is non-color as well. Drag in the color and drag in the normal. Now this is probably too large of a texture for the object. So we'll hit shift A, type in mapping. And then we'll type in coordinate like that. And we'll drag this into our vector. We'll drag this out to our vector like so. Drag this out to our vector, drag this out to our vector like that. And we'll hook this up like that. Then we'll zoom in like this and we'll put this at like a 10 or something like that. And you can see that that's looking really nice. Now, if we Google, old oil wick handle or holder, I should say, you'll see that we have things like this. So it's more of like a brownish color, if that makes sense. So for us to do something like that, that would require us to change the color of this to be more brownishy. And we're, we would want it to lose some of its luster, right? We'd want it to be less as shiny. Now we might want to make this 20. That's probably more accurate. But what we'd want to do to make it lose some of that luster and make it a bit darker, a bit more brown is if we hit shift A, we can add in a mix RGB and we can mix in just a touch bit of that brown color like that. And then we can adjust our factor to add in some of that, that faltering luster that we have. We could also try to see if multiply will give us a better result. And in my case, I don't know if it really does. So what we can do is if we mess around with it a little bit more, maybe do a mix like that. Now it loses some of its luster. So let's hit shift A and let's add in a color ramp and we'll drop that in. And if we pull this back, you'll see that it starts pulling back that luster. Now we could do this or the cool thing is, is when we select these guys, you can see how we can drag them, right? We can also select this and change its color. So we could pull this back and drag this down and you'll see how it becomes shinier, right? So if we do the other side, if we click and we drag this up, you'll see how it starts losing its luster without us needing to adjust anything. So we could pull this back to something like that. And there we go. Now all we have to do is make it just slightly less metallic. So let's just grab this guy, duplicate it, put it here, and then let's mess with it, see how it looks. So if we drag this down and we drag this guy down, what happens? You'll see how it becomes less metallic. So we could pull this down just a touch to make it less metallic feeling. And there you go. It's lost a lot of its luster. It's getting a little bit on the older side. It's been around for a while.
And then we can come in here, adjust our brownness of it. Because if we keep it at this color, you can see how it doesn't quite look right. But if we just mix a bit of brown in there, it helps with making it feel a bit older. And if we want to, we can even come in here and type in noise, drop in a noise texture, and then drop in a color ramp like this, drag this guy into here like this, drag this guy into here like this. And then I can come in here and just start crunching these guys to give pockets of brown. So we can come in here, pull this up. You can see how that kind of works. Now, obviously, this brown is kind of taking away from some of the detail. You can see how it rips out a lot of that detail. So we might not necessarily want to do it that way. Maybe we'd want to do instead of a mix, maybe we would want to do maybe a overlay. See if that gives us a better result. Well, kind of, not really though. So let's try and do this. So if we drag this guy back to here, we get rid of these two. We hit Shift A and RGB. We could drop it in RGB curves. So you'll want to add maybe just a touch bit of red to this object. Maybe pull some of the green out. Maybe pull some of the blue out. That's probably too much red. We just want to make it feel like it's lost some of its brilliance over time. And something else that we should do here is if this burns, it's going to be a lot blacker on the inside of this than it is going to be on the outside because of smoke and soot and things like that. So we can bring this guy into texture paint and we can paint out some blackness to this. Now we don't actually have a texture to paint onto or anything to really mix it with. So if we go back to our shading and we add in all of the stuff that we need to mix this. So let me come in here and hit shift a and do a mix with black like that. You'll see that we have black and we don't have black. And then we'll just add in our image like we did before. We'll hit new and we'll set this to 2048. And we'll say instead of untitled, let's call it wick holder burn. And we'll just drag this on here like so. And then we can come into our texture paint and we can paint this wick holder burn. We can come in here. We can try to paint this up real nice. You'll see as I paint the darkness in, that kind of helps, that can give realism to your object. Now this is way too much burn for a wick, right? So we don't necessarily want it to be that strong, but we can just kind of drag this guy down. So we'll just come in here and paint with white. Just start darkening this a bit. Drag this down a touch probably too much. And we'll drag this up. And there we go. We got a little bit of soot, a little bit of dirt. And if we want to make it extra realistic, what we could do is we could come in here and we could go into our shading. We drag this guy up. We could just duplicate this to our roughness and our metallic. And then we can mix this with, in metallic's case, black, because we don't want it to be metallic, and roughness, we can mix it with white, because we'd want it to be rough. We can drag this down like so, put it into the factor value, drag this down, put it into the factor value, and you'll see what that does to it. So this now is very mad, because it's been, you know, soot has built up on it, and has made it darker. We can come back to our texture painting, mess around with it a bit more. Now that's probably way too strong, but I'm going to fill it in nice and strong first, and then we'll back it off in a moment. 
Then we'll drag this down like so. We'll drag our strength back to something like 0.14 and we'll just start pulling it back. And I'm gonna to wanna to change how my curve fall off is set. So I'm gonna work my way around the edges to help smoothen it out. There we go. That gives us a nice burned look to it. And now we got to do our wick. So I'm going to head over to that. So we'll go to our shading. We'll click on our wick and we're going to give it another new material. Now we don't have to go to the material panel and assign it a new material. We could just do it right here if we want to. We could just come in here, click the X, click new, and we're going to need to find a cotton wick. So thankfully, I think Ambient CG can come in handy for us again. So let's take a look at it and see if it has something. So if we look up fabric, I don't know if you guys have ever seen a cotton wick before, but a cotton wick looks something like this, give or take. So it's a woven fabric of sorts that basically is woven together and then a lot of times they have these little lines through it it doesn't have to have that but a lot of times they do so if we can find a woven fabric like that that would be perfect now looking at this they do have this which is close ish and they do have this which is also close so i feel like this will work well so we'll just grab this one And you'll notice that we don't have a metallic texture here. And that's on purpose because it doesn't have any metallicness to it. So all we have to do is just set this to zero and we're good. And then all we have to do is make sure that our roughness is set to non-color, make sure that our normal is set to non-color. And then all we have to do is add in a mapping node like so. And then we can add in a coordinate node like that and then we could just drop in our uvs we can drag this in we can drag this in and we can drag this in now all we have to do is just come in here and set this to something like 20 and that might be a bit on the small side so let's try 10. that's really close now if you've ever seen these wicks they're not super thick so we'll make this thinner so we'll go into edit mode right here and then we'll hit G Y. We'll make it much tinier like that. Now, if you've never seen an oil wick and how it burns, this is how it burns. So it just burns that tip to a straight black color. So we can basically just grab this, pull it down a tiny bit. Cause a lot of times these wicks only have a little bit exposed and we can basically I'm gonna grab this on the X axis pull it back a little bit. I'm going to grab these two with two and I'm going to hit control B to bevel. And then all we have to do is grab all of this and I will just basically duplicate this principle BSDF. I will grab a mix RGB. We'll put this guy in like so. We'll put this guy in and we'll put this guy in. We'll put in a mix shader and I will drag this guy into the top, this guy into the bottom, and then I'll drag this guy into the surface. And you'll see that it's being mixed with white, right? So if we go to zero, it's black or white. If not, it's the texture. And all we have to do is say high roughness, pretty much black, as black as we can get it. And then we can just hit shift A, image, new, Okay, and drag this in. And now we can just go into our texture paint and let's clean this up. So first we'll come in. I'll set a texture map, so texture mask, so that way we have some kind of mask. And we know that the top needs to pretty much stay black. So what we can do is just come in here, drag this over. 
and make this black or I guess white looks like white. So then we'll just kind of start painting these in like, so I'm going to expand the size of this texture here by holding alt shift and dragging. And you'll see, and we're going to get some pattern up here. That's going to really help with making this look good. And I'm going to increase the strength of this brush by quite a bit. Drag it back down some. And drag it down. And there we go. You might want to add just a little bit of flair just to help with making it feel a little bit better. So we can just kind of come in and disrupt it just a touch. The user is not going to see this very much because it's going to be obscured by a fire for the most part anyway. So I'm not super concerned with making it look perfect, but there we go. Now I can get rid of my texture mask right like that. And now I just have two more items to do. I have this section right here and these rings, and that should be about it. And the cylinder, we forgot about our glass cylinder. And this one, I have some special stuff I wanna do. I'm gonna come into these guys, select both of them, go into texture paint mode on them. So object, I'll go into the texture painting and I will set it to, I believe white. So we'll paint this all as white because I'm okay with it having no rust except for I do want a touch bit of rust in a specific spot and I'll show you and I'll explain why in a moment. So I'm gonna come in here and I will grab the texture mask. I'm gonna drag this down and we're gonna paint rust right here where the two joints kind of show up, where they, they connect. And the reason why is because when two joints connect, they rust a lot faster than if they are separate. And it will add some needed variation within our object. And there we go. I think that will do it. And now all we got to do is go back to object mode. Like so select our other rings, go back to paint mode. And the coolest part about this is since these are all linked, it should be a five second process of just coming in here, filling it with white, like so and then adding some rust right here. So we'll just come up here, add just a little bit of rust right here. Maybe a touch bit of rust on our way down and then quite a bit of rust down here. And if we go to texture paint object mode, there we go. Now it's time for the last object before we call it for the day. So this is our glass. And if we tab into edit mode, you can see that our glass covers this whole section here, which is great. Now, what I want to do is I want to make it so that it's just slightly not transparent or it's just slightly not reflective. So what we'll do is we'll come into our shading like that and we'll zoom out and you'll see that we have this object here, material here. And you'll see that we have our alpha of 0 0.03. And if you remember, if we have it any farther than that, you'll see that it's perfectly invisible. So we want it to 0 0.03 or some low value. Now there are some things that other game engines don't care about, but we can get there when we get there. So we'll just hit shift A, add an image texture like so. We'll drag this into our roughness and into our alpha. We'll create new and we'll just add in a black texture. Now you'll see it's perfectly invisible. So what we'll do is we'll come into texture paint because we have an additional texture here. And what we can do is just come in with our stencil here and paint. Now, first I will fill this with a 
fill tool and I will drag this all the way down to just barely visible. And you can see, there you go. So now you can actually see what it looks like, right? It's back to where it was. But if we click on this and we drag this up and we set this to a light strength, something very tiny, we just start painting. You'll see what it does once I'm done and you will absolutely love it. So if we hit shift and make it a little smaller, And that should do it. So now if we close this, you'll see if you look at it, it has just a little bit of fingerprinting, a little bit of dark of non-reflectivity, and a little bit of dirt on it. And that'll help make it just look that much better. Now you could go a bit more in depth on this if you wanted to. You could put a second texture in here maybe rough it up a bit more, add some soot up here if we wanted to, but I don't know if we want to. I think it looks pretty good. And the nice thing is, is if we wanted to draw something specific, we could just come in and just start drawing. And you could see how that affects it like that. So it creates a really cool effect for us and we can make it however we want. We could even come in here at the top. I believe this is the top. Yeah, this is the top. Then we could add a bit of roughness directly to the top. If we want to add a little bit of extra roughness up there, I don't think it looks very good to add that roughness, but the fact of the matter is that we could, and that's kind of the power of doing this kind of system. Now I am going to intense, make this a bit more intense for us, just in sp some spots. There we go. And that should help with breaking it up just a tiny bit more. And we might not want it this intense, but I think that will work. But there we go. We have ourselves an asset. Now, our next big thing that we have to deal with is our asset is majorly over polyed. So if we take a look at all of our modifiers and we turn them all on again, you'll see it absolutely kill my machine. And you'll notice that it is at a very high polygon level. I believe it's like 200,000 and this is completely unacceptable. So in the next video, what we're going to talk about is how are we going to, how we can take this and make it into a game ready asset. We'll talk about baking textures. We're going to talk about baking normal maps and we're going to talk about, and we'll talk about optimizing textures using packing and things like that. So look forward to that. Hopefully I'll have that one out soon, but anyway, that's all I have for you guys today. So if you like this video, go ahead and hit that like button. Hey, you know, if you dislike this video, go ahead and hit that dislike button because I am here to make content for you guys. Your guys' feedback always means the world to me. I'm here to build stuff for you guys, and I want to know if I'm doing a good job. If you have any questions or comments, throw them in the comments below or, or hit me up on the Discord, and I will be more than happy to help you out with any issue that you might have. But that is all I have for you guys today. So thank you so much again for watching, and I will see you all next time. Thanks.